Hello everyone, my name is Jurian van der Sluis and I'm a drone coordinator and remote sensing analyst at the NWT Center for Geomatics in the government of the Northwest Territories. Today I'll provide an overview of some of the most recent remote sensing and mapping investigations of permafrost landslides across different spatial and temporal scales in the NWT. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the city of Yellowknife, which is located on Chief Dry Geese territory. It is the traditional land of the Yellowknife's Denny First Nation, and most recently, the homeland of the North Slave Métis Alliance. We're also grateful to the indigenous peoples of the Satu, Quichan, and Inuvialuit settlement regions of the Northwest Territories for their support and guidance and the opportunity to work collaboratively on their lands. The work presented today is part of a long-term research and monitoring program led by the Northwest Territories Geological Survey. So in particular, I'd like to recognize the vision, expertise, and shared field experiences of permafrost scientist Steve Kokel and Ashley Rudy, who have been instrumental in the content you will see today. The goal of the presentation is to showcase how geospatial technologies are used within NWT permafrost circles. Before we begin, we need to discuss a few key concepts about permafrost and its thaw to understand the scope of the problems, its challenges and information needs before we can answer questions about how remote sensing is used to learn about NWT's changing landscape and what the future may hold. One of the key takeaways of this presentation ought to be that the nature and implications of permafrost thaw are complex due to rapidly evolving conditions, intensifying and nonlinear responses, and cascading cumulative effects. The latest disruptive geospatial innovations are one of several solutions needed to meet these information needs. Permafrost is a phenomenon directly related to climate. It is defined as ground, such as soil, rock, and organic material that remains at a temperature of zero degrees or lower for at least two consecutive years. Most of the permafrost as existing today formed during cold glacial periods, and therefore much of it is thousands of years old. A typical classification, such as what you can see on the map here on the right, focuses on continuous permafrost underlying 90 to 100% of the landscape, discontinuous permafrost where the landscape is covered by between 50 to 90% and sporadic permafrost anywhere from 1 to 50% of the landscape. Permafrost is related to climate, its surface and lithological properties such as snow and soil thermal characteristics. With respect to landslides, ground ice content in permafrost is where things get interesting. Ground ice, a commonly observed feature throughout high latitude regions, is responsible for many landforms and is directly influencing topography, vegetation, and the response of the landscape to environmental changes. Ground ice refers to all types of ice formed in freezing and frozen ground and occurs in the pores, cavities, voids, and other openings in soil and rock. It is classified by various descriptors, but for brevity, we only discuss the concept of excess ice content here. Excess ice content refers to the volume of water present should a vertical column of frozen sediment be thawed. In this case, the sample is allowed to thaw and the relative volumes of supersaturated sediment and standing water are noted. Frozen sediments containing excess ice are thaw sensitive and may be contrasted to thaw-stable materials which contain no excess ice. The latter are not subject to thaw settlement and retain much of their mechanical strength when thawed. The thermal state of permafrost is sensitive to changing climatic conditions and in particular to rising air temperatures and changing snow regimes. This is important because over the past few decades the atmosphere in polar and high elevation regions have warmed warmer than anywhere else. Warmer and wetter conditions as a result of climate change has reduced ground stability. This phenomenon is often referred to as thermokarst, describing the processes and landforms that, have, that involve the collapse of the land surface as a result of melting of ground ice. In this field camera time lapse, one can see a small landslide consisting of a headwall made predominantly of ice and a muddy slump floor. Throughout the summer season, the headwall regresses into the hill slope due to continual thaw of exposed soil and melting of ground ice. The muddy slump floor moves downslope into stream valleys or lakes. In contrast to landslides in temperate regions, permafrost thaw induced landslides can remain active for decades as long as ground ice remains exposed. 
They can also go dormant and remain inactive for tens or hundred, hundreds of years before reactivating if conditions change. Land users and local community members in the Gwich'in and Inuvialuit regions have recognized that slumping is increasing. The fault sediment often makes its way downstream, affecting terrestrial and freshwater environments upon which local communities depend for food, travel, and cultural activities. Thermokarst means different things in different regions. It is very diverse in its appearance, and to highlight this, a typical field setting, we show an example of a tributary to the Willow River, west of Aklavik. This two kilometer stretch of drone data shows at least 23 thaw-induced landslides. For this presentation, what is important to note is how many of these features can lo be located on the landscape over short distances, as well as the diversity of landslides that require detailed attribute information. Closer inspection reveals areas of surface creep, micro to mega-sized slumps, ice-rich slumps, ice-poor slumps, ancient slumps, stabilized slumps and reactivated slumps, as well as rotational and bedrock controlled landslides. Any kind of larger scale inventory needs to be aware of this diversity. And when in the field, we need a quick way to collect a lot of data to support other mapping initiatives. These dramatic landscape features occur not only in the hinterlands, where they change downstream water quality of concern to NWT communities, but also affect key infrastructure corridors, such as the Dempster Highway, as you can see here on the left, as well as quarries providing aggregate resources to develop and maintain roads. Even if these landslides are not located directly in the highway right away, with each thaw season, there are risks of future downslope movement towards the highway. Here's an example of Dempster Highway, kilometer 28.5, whereby on the left image dated 2015, a typical slump can be seen with an annual headwall erosion that, that is deposited right at the base of the headwall with minimal creep at the base before stabilization occurs as indicated by yellow vegetation. In the right video, dated 2019, that same slump is shown after a rapid expansion episode. Relatively warm thawed material created a large downslope debris tongue to the highway. The acceleration of thaw slumping has created a spectacular exposure of icy permafrost 15 to 20 meters high, which has increased saturated slurries that further increase the potential for downslope flow of materials towards the Dempster Highway. Three dimensional fly throughs and oblique photos can be deceiving but some of these landslides are astonishingly large. In this example, a person is shown for scale by the red arrow on top of a 40 meter wall of ice and frozen sediment. This approaches the height of the tallest buildings in Yellowknife and area-wise, it would cover the majority of Yellowknife's downtown. In these mega slums, millions of cubic meters of material have thawed and moved downstream. In contrast to landslides with massive headwalls, there are also large permafrost thaw landslides that become instable at depth rather than at the surface. These deep-seated failures can slide along the base of permafrost for many years, as is shown on the left, before finally failing catastrophically as shown on the right Sentinel-2 time-lapse. A common thread of ever-expanding geospatial capabilities, such as in remote sensing and machine learning, is juxtaposed against rapidly intensifying permafrost thaw with many growing information gaps by communities and governments alike. There's an urgent need to improve information on permafrost thaw extent and frequency, types and the diversity of thaw, as well as the implications to our infrastructure, ecological and cultural environments. Some needs, but certainly not all, can be filled through remote sensing. Other solutions include continual field-based studies and monitoring, better characterization of subsurface conditions such as ground ice and surficial geology, and calibrated models to map geohazards and implications over larger areas and longer timeframes. Working in the permafrost discipline in the NWT means working across different scales. Investigations are needed across space and time. If you go by surface area or tools spend 12 orders of magnitude, 
Field surveys, regional monitoring, and satellite imagery are being used to monitor and map landslides across the NWT within a highly multidisciplinary team. The following slides show a few examples at each scale. At the field scale, we use drones to track how fast slumps grow by accurately recording the position of the headwall through time. On the left, an example of how a slump headwall has moved over 100 meters laterally since the 2008 baseline, with thaw up to 15 meters a year. On the right, an example of a thermal image of the same slump, showing where the headwall is coolest, indicating exposures of large bodies of ground ice. These observations are corroborated with those headwall retreat rates as the slump grows fastest in the area where the ground ice is exposed at the surface. Beyond true color and thermal mosaics, we also have access to DEM time series, which allow the calculation of volumetrics of thought material and the visualization of material mobilization. On the left, an example of an annual change detection illustrating areas of major elevation drops in Cyan, more or less concentrated near headwalls, and elevation gains in pink. On the right, an example of a seasonal rather than annual behavior where the slump was mapped four times during the thaw season. Here we can observe that the majority of mobilization occurs later in the season, whereby August and September are important months where most of the slump floor is active with thaw and debris pulses. At the regional scale, we use LIDAR to characterize slumps further. The combination of rapidly increasing dynamics, broad distribution, and an extremely wide range of environmental implications results in slumping to be an important process to study on the landscape. As disturbances enlarge, their environmental and biogeochemical implications increase as well, and so does the frequency with which they interact with infrastructure, which poses a growing geohazard risk. Herein is a need to go beyond slump detection via machine learning or classifying slump surface, surface area. And this is because there is a nonlinear volumetric scaling when slumps increase in area and activity. Three-dimensional slump enlargement can be quantified using LIDAR. The photos show several thaw slumps on the Peel Plateau across a size age continuum, illustrating how an increase in surface area and hydrological connectivity leads to dramatically larger scar volumes and depth of thaw. On the right, we show that a power law relationship exists between slump area and thawed volume. With this calibrated model, we can therefore estimate the volume of thawed material knowing just its slump, the slump area. Understanding the current distribution of thaw-sensitive terrain enables us to predict the future state of NWT landscapes. At the regional scale, in this case the entire Willow River watershed near Aklavik, we show where slumps occur and how thawed sediments accumulate in lakes and rivers. Slums are not uniformly distributed on the landscape, but occur in hotspots, as indicated by the gray circles. What is important to note for this presentation is that in terms of field data collection, we are in a unique window of time where permafrost thaw is occurring at an increasingly fast pace. And thus when the opportunity presents itself, we need to collect as much data as possible to calibrate and validate other mapping initiatives. For the work shown here, we use a nested design where drone observations in the Beaufort Delta were used to track how slump area and volumes change over time which in turn was actually used to inform the regional slump area to volume model shown on the previous slide using lighter DEMs along highway corridors. This relationship of area to volume was then applied to Landsat inventories of slumps in the Willow River watershed to show how the total thought volume of landslides have increased more than a hundredfold since 1986 and the trajectory of this is not linear, as you can see by the estimated volumes for the three different observation periods. At present, there are many applications for drones, as shown on the previous slides at the local scales. However, two limitations of current drone capabilities are the regulatory requirements to remain within visual line of sight and the limited endurance based on battery technology. This results in having to move takeoff and landing locations when larger areas need to be mapped. A move towards so-called beyond visual line of sight missions alleviate these limitations. 
Recently, we have collaborated on a long endurance drone project in the NWT based on beyond visual line of sight technology with respect to Arctic infrastructure and environmental monitoring. This was conducted with a multitude of local, regional and international collaborators, including the Government of Canada, Fisheries and Oceans, as well as the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hereby, we mapped the Inuvik to Taktiaktuk and Dempster highways with beyond visual line of sight technology. Our, goal, our goals were to determine how where the proof of concept long range missions could be designed with regulators and airspace authorities to safely operate over long distances to help inform regulators future regulations as well as standard operating procedures. The second objective was to determine how these missions could then be used to obtain photogrammetric imagery for mapping purposes. And thirdly, what the data quality was of such mapping deliverables. In this project, we pushed the boundaries of the technology and data processing systems, flying longer and collected more data and covered larger areas than any other drone project in Canada that we're aware of. The findings and outputs of this project will be publicly available to share lessons learned with the broader community and to encourage future developments in this space. Now we're going up another scale. At the landscape scale, satellite remote sensing and cloud computing are promising technologies for monitoring landscape changes in remote northern environments. The NWT Center for Geomatics, supported by Castless Consulting, generated territory-wide change maps, leveraging 35 years of Landsat imagery in Google Earth Engine, using methods specifically designed to distinguish gradual long-term changes by minimizing interannual and seasonal variation. When combined as an image composite, these trends in landsat brightness, greenness, and wetness form patterns of different colors across the landscape that relate to wildfire, erosion, hydrological changes, as well as anthropogenic developments. The trend analysis have highlighted a diversity of thaw-driven landslide disturbances, which require expert validation and interpretation. For instance, permafrost thaw landslides in the Peel Plateau area are well-defined in blue, as you can see on the example on the left. Whereas visual interpretation of landslides in the Satu region is challenged by patterns of regeneration after wildfires. While on Banks Island in the high Arctic, some landslides are poorly detailed altogether. This work remains ongoing. The landslide trend analyses occur simultaneously with other initiatives to characterize thermokarst in the NWT by means of the thermokarst collective. This is a collaborative approach between government and academic researchers to develop and implement a mapping methodology to generate NWT-wide maps of thermokarst and permafrost features. To help support both initiatives, a systematic aerial inventory of permafrost terrain leveraging a digital survey application in ArcGIS Survey123 and georeference photos is underway. Based on the amount of field resources forecasted, we foresaw a need for a rapid data collection tool without cumbersome record management or geo-enablement. This brought us to developing this custom app. With results uploaded to the cloud after each field day, the team keeps track of detailed analytics and can reprioritize areas for drone tasking at the next available opportunity to learn more about specific landslides observed. So far, we've flown about 26,000 kilometers of helicopter flight lines, collected 30,000 geo-enabled photos, and made more than 5,500 thermocarst observations across many different ecoregions in the NWT. These data sets will form the foundation of thermocarst interpretations, upscaling, as well as image analysis work. To show how far 26,000 kilometers actually is, it's as if you would fly in a helicopter from Vancouver, BC to St. John's, Newfoundland, then all the way to alert Nunavut, back to Vancouver, and doing that one more time. It's been an astonishing opportunity to see the NWT landscape like this in the last two years. Rapidly intensifying permafrost thaw creates many growing and evolving information gaps by communities and governments alike. Our long-term holistic research and monitoring program has been designed to address information needs from different spatial and temporal scales, whereby collectively the data analyses can be used through a structured iterative process whereby field observations support regional and landscape level satellite work 
and vice versa. This process relies on partnerships with various government departments, indigenous organizations, academic partners, as well as industry. When collaborations are local in nature, they will help ensure that the acquired knowledge meets northern needs, advance northern interests, and benefit northern residents. However, collaborations and partnerships lose meaning in the absence of capacity to connect, guide, or understand the efforts of external groups. By conducting core research and monitoring that generates NWT-relevant permafrost knowledge, we've made selective use of ever-expanding remote sensing capabilities to withstand and understand the nature and impl implications of permafrost thaw on the NWT. These capabilities have occurred along a beginning transition from a place where people come from away to do things in or for the North, to a future where partnerships are with the North or even led by the North. This transition is exemplified by several new permafrost and climate change related positions at the GNWT, as well as a Western Arctic Center for Geomatics in Anuvik. These create promise for a resilient Northern society and a place where contributions of subject matter experts can increasingly be supported, understood, and applied in a collaborative framework through equitable partnerships. If you have any questions, feel free to pose them in the Q&A session, or otherwise, here's my email address to contact me directly. I'd also like to invite you to our website, which shows lots of different data sets and map viewers that you might find interesting, including our Landsat change detection work. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks everybody. Great presentation, uh, Yuri, and that was fantastic. Yeah, glad to be able to contribute to this conference. Yeah, uh, the Northwest Territory Center for Geomatics is our presenting partner for GeoIgnite this year. We really appreciate the support. Uh, a shout out to Melanie as well. Thank you for participating. I see you in the chat sharing some links. That's fantastic. Um, we've got some time for q and I see that we've got some questions uh, the first one is uh, appreciating the costs related to Arctic logistics. Why is there a continual need for ground-based observations in an era characterized by near daily satellite imagery and machine learning? So the mapping the location as well as the area of permafrost uh, landslides is one of many objectives of the ground, uh, of, of being on the ground, uh, but we work in a multidisciplinary team. So even though we could map uh, landslides uh, through recent satellite imagery, there's still a need to collect ground temperature data. There's still a need to collect soil samples to understand what is thawing. What is the, let's say the carbon flowing away from those landslides? Uh, water samples to check the water quality impacts. Um, while at the same time, we're maintaining weather stations to correlate all that, that slumping activity to air temperature and precipitation changes. Uh, we're recently working with more electro resistivity tomography to actually go into the subsurface and, and use some of those remote sensing tools as well to, to really understand the, the things that you cannot see uh, directly. And all in all, like even if we would were to uh, right away publish a map of all the landslides in the NWT, things are changing so fast that by the time you actually are done it, a particular map, things have already changed. And not so much even just in area, but also by permafrost thaw deepening as well. So that's why we continue to have boots on the ground despite the, uh, the costs. Are there any particular areas you've discovered that are um, that you're watching more closely than others? Yeah, for sure. So we highlighted uh, in the territory-wide map, we highlighted three areas uh, in the NWT. So one is the, the Mackenzie Delta, uh, close to Anuvik, uh, Klavik, and Fort McPherson. Another area is the Sawtu region. Uh, and then in the high Arctic, there's lots of uh, landslides that we're aware of. And they are definitely clustered in the more uh, hillside terrain areas uh, and areas known with uh, continuous permafrost and lots of ground ice. For the materials that end up in the watershed, has there been any assessment of what impact that's having? Yeah, for sure. Um, that's, that's mainly work that's uh, been done with the universities that uh, we've collaborated with. We have water samples that you can't actually run through 
uh, standard water quality instruments because the readings are way off the chart in terms of sediment load, for example. There is carbon flowing away. Uh, there's impacts to fish and invertebrates. Uh, there's even cadmium and, and, and other uh, chemical, uh, chemicals coming out of these hills that have been frozen for 10,000 years uh, and are now being released through, through permafrost thaw. So lots of different attributes to, uh, to monitor, for sure. There's nothing that could be done other than monitoring at this point to mitigate. There's no mitigation for this. Well, mitigations have, have uh, that, that previously have been, have been implemented are related to infrastructure development, so including pipelines, for example. So along the Mackenzie Valley uh, pipeline corridor, for example, um, there are wood chips, for example, like insulating the, 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 the slums and, and making sure that ground ice is not being exposed. But that's really only been tested at, at small individual stream crossings, for example, and it's not easily uh, scaled up to, to larger areas. But it works? Uh, we don't know, actually. If I don't think it has ever been tested on these mega slumps because uh, you would need millions of cubic meters of full chips. But on yeah. the small stuff, it's that's what's being done. It, it's, it remains stable uh, to the extent that we've been able to monitor it, yes. Uh, what's one of the most surprising things that you learned from a geospatial perspective? But to help on interpret satellite-based changes, um, we're currently actually compiling uh, existing landslide inventories in the, in the NWT. Uh, and to date, was that harmonization of these data sets have shown that there's actually a tremendous amount of work that has been uh, done in the past, but usually at like posted stamp type regions of interest and never really a big picture overview. Um, but a lot of these data sets are really hard to discover. Uh, or are not accessible at all. Even when they are available, everybody has kind of come up with their own definitions of landslides, their own attributes. So uh, standardizing that uh, is challenging. But the most interesting part of, of that exercise has been that um, people have been mapping slums. And the earliest I found in inventory dates back from 1963. Mm -hmm. So these are, it just illustrates that uh, these landslides exist on the landscape for a long time. Uh, lots of different work is available, but there's definitely within the geospatial community a need for better harmonization, better standardization, and compilation of these data sets. Well, thank you so much for sharing your research. That was a, uh, and it remains, a, it's a, an incredibly large project, as you described. Uh, it must have been incredibly complex and a lot of data to go through and analyze. Is there anything in the future that we can expect to hear about? Uh, there's lots of different work coming out. Uh, as I mentioned, there is uh, now increased northern capacity to uh, to do this work, and and that will all be based on on open data and open reports to to share this with the, the community at large. And then specifically on some of the remote sensing tools, uh, the beyond visual line of sight data, for example, will be uh, all online as well for user testing, uh, performance testing, and next generation of algorithms and, and, and those kind of things. And this can be found on your website? That will be found soon, yeah, as the, the GNWT is working towards an open data uh, policy to, to bring out more of these uh, information and data pieces. All right, well, thank you very much, Urian. We really appreciate you coming to share this with us. I think it's an important part of the climate story that we're um, sharing. Uh, with everybody over the next three days. So thanks a lot for that. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here.